Hi, everyone. This is Eric Martin for the band Mr. Big, and you are watching, listening, feeling, vibing on Sonic Perspective. Hi everyone and welcome to another interview of Sonic Perspectives. I'm Rodrigo and our guest today is the singer Eric Martin from Eric Martin Band and Mr. Big. Eric, great to have you with us. Uh, great to be here. Ta-da! <laughs> Let I mean, me ask I you. Was, you know, Go ahead. This, this is terrible. I was, gonna, I was just about to say great to be with you, but then <laughs> I went, oh God, don't, don't ever say that. That's just <laughs> uncool to use your tune for, you know. That's all right. For, for, to get over all right. Yeah. But uh, let me ask you, how have you kept busy during this almost one year of quarantine? Are you kidding me? I'm still in my pajamas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, how have I kept busy? Well, uh, you know, over the last maybe seven years in between Mr. Big shows, I've been doing acoustic uh, concerts pretty much all over the world, mm. like 10, 10 times over, probably about 110 shows, maybe more a year. And so last year was just a complete bust. I had some shows in January in Europe um, well, as a special guest for a, for a group called The Front Men, uh, which was the singer of 10CC, uh, singer and uh, guitar player for the Hollies and the singer for the Sweet, you know, all like 60, famous 60s rock and roll bands. Right. And I was their special guest and I sang a couple of their songs and they, and then we sang like uh, To Be With You, Wild World and a kind of rare Mr. Big song called Long Way Down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did a 10, 10 city tour in Germany and it was for a DVD and that was great. And um, then I ventured around Europe and played acoustic shows on my own. And then when I was coming home, uh, I, I thought it was an incredibly longer line than it usually is at customs. <laughs> and it was like at, the, like at the end of January. And I took a selfie of myself, mm. but like I held it up and with the lines behind me. And it was like thousands of people at customs a lot of Chinese folks, you know, but which is whatever, but like nobody's wearing a mask. Right. And it was yeah. like before you really, before they told you that that was a prerequisite, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then shortly after that, you know, the pandemic, the talk of the pandemic was happening and, and I continued to play shows from, uh, February to October, not a lot, like maybe two shows a month mm. playing like what I call COVID comfortable shows where uh, I'd have contracts with club owners who would say, you know, cause it was acoustics who so would be like cables and chairs. Right. Right. And, and then I said, okay, the contract is that I don't care where it is. You got to put a barricade, like an iron maiden type of barricade <laughs> in front of the stage and then uh, masks. Uh, are required for like the first, you know, couple rows, no meet and greet, which I used to, used to call meet and die. <laughs> yeah, none of that. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, so I was doing that all the way up until October and I played this one show in Illinois and it was really sketchy. There's a lot of people milling about and all the shows that I've done, you know, were, were from the requirements of like what, you know, the government was telling you to do, I mean, like, you know, five, six feet apart, no contact, just mm. play the show. I played two hours. I, no, actually, I probably played about a, an hour and a half and I talked for about a half an hour. I can't <laughs> shut up. And then, uh, and then, you know, do that thing. Anyway, long story short, 
I was doing that. And then, and that one show, one or two shows in Illinois, it was really sketchy. People were not paying attention. Right. And uh, they looked like they were like super spreaders. Right. Mm. And so I went, I went home and from, uh, and, and look, it was, it was a bleak, bleak year for yeah. any musician, but you know, I, I felt it pretty heavy because I mean, I've been on, uh, I've, you know, I've, I've been pretty consistent with all the other little things I have with the acoustic shows, Mr. Big, this rock opera that I'm a part of called Aventasia and a lot of shit, you know, mm-hmm. from October, November, December. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, it's, it's been worse than that, but, uh, I've, I've, I've dealt with it. I've, uh, it took me that long to load cyberpunk and mm. PlayStation four. <laughs> that's all right just get it get it yeah. yeah no it's okay i mean whatever tool you find to survive you know if it's a video game if it works for you that's fine <laughs> yeah but uh hey, I'm, hey, yeah. If, if i first of all the video game you you gotta okay look so i'm so i write songs and you know pick up the guitar every mm. day try to get a you know, sometimes when I wake up or I'm starting to sing a little bit in the afternoon, I'm realizing that I haven't used my my instrument, my 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 flesh instrument in a long time. Mm. That sounds disgusting. My vocal cords in a yeah. long time. And uh, and so, you know, I'll do a vocal lesson here and there to keep my chops up. And and I'm also writing with one of the uh, guitar players that in Avantasia. His name is Oliver Hartman mm-hmm. from Germany. And him and I have been sending um, music back and forth for a good year now. Like kind of Americana, kind of rock rock and roll. Old 70s type of classic rock and roll. And um, you know, and, and you know, producing, kind of co-producing this new Mr. Big project that's coming out a live project that's coming out in the middle of February. I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, uh, video games, hey man, it's either that or drink myself to death, you know? <laughs> right. Fair enough, whatever works for you. I, I'm surprised you didn't put up put together like a live session or any kind of thing like that. Some musicians are doing it, right? Oh dude. Yeah. <laughs> oh dude. I was on the phone all night last night. I, I've been trying to get a streaming show together mm. and i had something where it, like, it was going to be called eric martin and skeleton crew and i had a the skeleton crew was these musicians and singers uh mainly it was a family mm. um this guy tal morris is a guitar player and his wife amber singer and then the other guitar player monroe brisman he, uh, guitar player and his wife april they're all guitar players singers fantastic family they're quarantined together which makes it pretty safe you know yeah and i was hope i was hoping to get them for like the last couple months now but they had a death in the family and i had to wait which you know hey look they're um they're my brothers and sisters and i love them and i waited and right now we're negotiating a live streaming show oh couple, that's cool. but it, you know it won't be for no, but it won't be for a couple months, you know, but it's something. Right. Fair enough. Uh, I'm glad you're working with Hartman. He has a fantastic band. It's, you know, it takes his surname. It's Hartman. A good hard rock band from, from Europe. It's nice. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you guys have to share. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, 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 I work with him in a bunch of, when a couple projects is, Mm. One project a couple of years ago called Rock Meets Classic, mm. and it w- and he was the musical director, and it was oh my god, it was one of my highlights of my life. It was Ian Gill singing with Ian Gill, like so we all all these uh, singers they had like Mark Storacci from Crocus, wow, uh, uh. John Wetton from Asia, um, Ian Gillen, uh, Rick Parfit from Status Quo on guitar, you know, they, and, and they had a 40 piece orchestra and they all played our music and it was sold out shows and it was great. But at the end of the night, it would be, uh, Ian Gillen singing smoke on the water. And I got a second verse 
Wow. And I, <laughs> I, can, I can still see it to this day. Rodrigo, man, mm. claim to fame, man. He, <clears throat> Ian Gillen goes, okay, take it, Eric. And I'm like, <laughs> look at you. And there, you know, the gigantic puddle all around me. I was so excited. <laughs> so fantastic. Dream come true. But anyway, right? yeah, Oliver yeah. Hartman. Yeah. yeah. Dream come true. Oliver Hartman uh, kind of, you know, helped me make that, helped make that happen for me. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, he's a good guy. I can't wait to uh, come up with something fresh. Yeah. And uh, do you think we can see some in the future, uh, some release more in the vein of the Mr. Vocalist series that you did? or? Uh, I don't know. I think that kind of ran its course. That was, a, I was going to say that was a lot of fun, but it was a mm. lot of hair pulling. <laughs> uh, it was really hard to do because <clears throat> just to, you know, see so your listeners know what I went through to do this, but I was asked by uh, Sony mm. in Japan, Sony Records, to do a project that was um, was famous uh, Japanese singers, all their hit songs, sung by a male vocalist, but with American lyrics. They were the, it was, it was the Japanese lyrics translated to English lyrics, ah. but tried, you know, and tried, tried to put a little, po you know, American poetic into it because Japanese lyrics are kind of a haiku. They're a different kind of poem, you know? Right. It was like, it was like five verses, four different choruses. It's, Jesus. It, it was tedious to, to uh, rewrite some of that stuff. But yeah, I did, um, I, I, what did I do? I did three, two or three albums that were like sung from uh, the female uh, stars and then they did a male stars hit songs and I did that and I did a Christmas album I did a live uh, DVD and album shit I did a lot of stuff and I had to dress up in all these fancy suits and all that kind of stuff but yeah. the, the one album that was great for me and I had the most, most fun with was uh, an album called Timeless and it was these Japanese folks had a contest uh, uh, Sony put a contest out for all the Japanese fans, and they said, "What would you like Eric Martin to to sing?" Mm. That's like a you know, again going with that female thing, <clears throat> but famous songs uh, that are that are outside of Japan, uh, you know, foreigners, Americans, uh, Europeans, right. Canadians, mm. if you will, anything you want. Yeah? And so it was it was like me singing. Mariah Carey's hero, me singing <laughs> Cindy Lauper time after time. Yeah. Me singing, uh, and I'm, and I did hero kind of like I would do it if I was in Mr. Big or, you know, as a Mr. Big style. Mm -hmm. So as my, the male perspective of, of, uh, these, uh, hit songs. But yeah, that was, that was my most, uh, that was a treasure for me to do because, you know, uh, a lot, a lot of the songs that I did with all that Mr. Vocalist stuff, nobody had ever heard of, just the Japanese, but those uh, American ones and European ones, whatever, uh, it was universal. Yeah. And yeah, it was a lot of fun, but it was, it was hard as hell to do the whole thing. But like is that first, you know, when they said, um, okay, we're going to call it Mr. Vocalist. And it was like, really? <laughs> you know, what? Really? I go, it's kind of, it's kind of pretentious. Mr. Vocalist, huh? Yeah. And then I, I was like, ah, kind of skeptical and a lot of hard work. I went to a, a recorded, you know, it was a recorded in Japan and then I did it in America. One of the albums I was in Japan and I did it. But, you know, I, I finished the record and I came home and, and I go, and I was telling people again, yeah, Mr. Vocalist. And they're like, really? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And that, and that first album sold 300,000 records. And, I, and then, you know, the next thing, next words out of me were like, I'm Mr. Vocalist. <laughs> <You know. laughs> right. my, my, manager, my, my manager that managed um, Mr. Big for years, and he managed Journey, his name was Herbie Herbert. And he mm -hmm. would say, 
Eric, it's not the money. It's the fucking money. Anyway, <laughs> so I did it. <laughs> yeah. I did it for the kids, but I did for I did I also did it for the cash, you know. And it was yeah. hey, look, it was great. It was a great project, and there was a lot of good songs on it. And there was, you know, uh, that timeless record. There was a song called "Superstar" mm -hmm. on it, written by, uh, well, the Carpenters did it, but uh, it was a kind of famous duo called Del Delaney and Bonnie, and they did it. They wrote it, and it was, it's like one of my best vocals ever. You know, next to "To Be with You," I would say that was like my best vocal ever. Anyway. That's my story. Oh, Sad wow. but true. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I, I something that uh, got me curious as well is like how you're worshipped in Japan, even from the Mr. Big days. There's a couple of Mr. Big live albums that were only released there. How do you explain that? Uh, campaigning, mm. just being ambassadors of uh, goodwill and good rock and roll. And we always came back because a lot of people that go to Japan, you know, it's just, it's really expensive to go and mm -hmm. to stay. And then, you, you know, you work and everything. And those first couple of years when we worked, and we were playing tiny little clubs and spending all kinds of money to play there. But we knew, you know, hey, you know, this we're going to have a, a great relationship in the future. And uh, we grew up with a lot of these people over the years. I mean, we played... One of those live albums I was just looking at the other day, it said uh, it was a, uh, a hundred shows. So it doesn't seem like that much to people, but mm. going to Japan, so a hundred shows in wow. Japan. That's a lot, man, I think. Anyway, yeah. um, you know, campaigning and writing, you know, doing doing your part to to to, to get a great audience and make friends with a lot of the, a lot of the fans, a lot of, um, way before emails and texts and stuff. And I was sitting on the floor of my hotel room many a night till like three o'clock in the morning, you know, signing letters and licking right. stamps and the whole <laughs> bit. And, um, but just a campaign, if you will. Yeah. You know, Billy, Billy Sheehan went over there first and, and said, hey, man, we got to come back here. I mean, this is the greatest place on earth. So, <laughs> And that's how we looked at it. Yeah. Paul even had an apartment there for a while, Paul Gilbert, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that was in the middle of our little hiatus. Um, mm. uh, but, yeah, yeah, he had, a, he had a girlfriend. He was working on uh, – a couple of variety shows and do maybe going to school. I don't know if he was going to school or not, but yeah, he lived there. Um, he loved, he loved Japan. I mean, you know, right. his wife is Japan, Japanese. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that, that helps. That helps for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in parallel with that, let me take a tangent here. Uh, there's your involvement also with Avantasia, which is quite a unique type of show, very theatrical, mm -hmm bombastic sort of shows. It must be a fun gig to be part of. It is a lot of fun. I like the, you know, I, I didn't, I knew of the people mm. that uh, were part of it, but I never met them before. Um, so to be a sandwich, as the leader yeah. and the creator and the, the brainchild of Aventasia. And, he, you know, he was the thing, he is the singer of a, a another band called Ed Guy, yeah. which is kind of, popular in, in Germany and he put together the thing uh, you know Avantasia had a couple of albums that it was just his band and himself and then he started lifting um, six maybe seven singers from around the world and it would be um, I mean there's all kinds of them but the one that I've been part of for the last seven years is uh, Ronnie Atkins lead singer for the Pretty Maids Mm -hmm. which, he's my toxic. He's my toxic twin. We're we're <laughs> we're partners in crime. I love this guy, big time. A great fucking great singer. Anyway, Ronnie Atkins, Bob Chatley from Magnum from England, and uh, you know I didn't know Ronnie, but I played in England one time, and Bob Chatley came up and sang. So that's the first time I met him. But he, you know, he's been 
super famous in England, and Europe for for many many years. You know, this is I you know I never got a chance to meet him, but he's a great singer. Um, well, oh, phenomenal, Yorn Landy. Oh yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, oh, I mean, you're. I, there are some listeners. Oh, most of the listeners. Um, and uh, people who read, uh, you know, Sonic Perspectives. I can't do it. Perspectives, Sonic yeah. Perspectives. Yeah. Uh, they know this guy, but some of these you don't know. Oh my God, he's like one of the greatest singers of all times. That that kind of kind of underrated. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Don't ever tell them. Don't don't ever say that to his face. You might get a, a, a <laughs> you might get a, a Viking a Viking battle axe. Through your skull, yeah. But uh, <laughs> don't he, talk. Don't directly look into his eyes. Uh, he'll turn sang, into a pillar of salt. <laughs> he's saying for Ingvar Malmsteen, so <laughs> I, I guess he has a thick skin. So, <laughs> oh yeah, he did. That's right. Yeah, I know a couple of them. Um, yeah. But anyway, Jordan Landy, Ronnie Atkins, Bob Tatley, um, uh, yeah, Jeff Tate got here. Jeff Tate, uh, yeah. yeah. Jeff Tate. Jeff yeah. Tate just showed up out of the blue. I mean, Mr. Big, Queen's Rank, we all come from, you know, the same kind of ilk yeah. genre or that kind of thing. But, but I never uh, I never met the guy before. The first time we meet really is, I think we were playing in Bakken in Germany, you know, 90,000 people, and we're headlining. I'm oh, like, wow. you're Jeff Tate. There's, <laughs> there was a... Uh, we, we we did a um we we were gonna be playing a gig together outside of Amantasia where it was Jeff Jeff Tate Operation Mind Crime opening to Mr. Big in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And and we were doing a um a kind of a like a a promo. And it's on it's on YouTube. You gotta check it out. It's it's freaking hilarious because <laughs> it's kinda of real it's kinda of real. We did it once and we're backstage at Bakken. And um, Jeff goes, I'm Jeff Tate, and this is, I go, I'm Eric Martin. And I go, wait, you're Jeff Tate? <laughs> you're Jeff Tate? And then I sort of got, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but I go, you're Jeff Tate? Queen's Rack. And he goes, well, yeah, I was in a band called Queen's Rack, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just Jeff Tate now. And I go, like, you're Jeff Tate. <laughs> you know, that shit. And he goes, you're, you're, you're Eric Martin. You're a great singer. And I'm like, ah, you're Jeff Tate. Anyway, <laughs> it's on YouTube. It, I'll check it it's out. A, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, but it's it's, a, it's fun, you know. Right. But anyway, yeah, me, Jeff Tate, Ronnie Atkins, Jordan Landy, Bob Catley, um, uh, Adrian Cohen. Cohen. Oh, yeah. A, uh, uh, heavy metal, dark kind of, you know, heavy metal singer. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've heard a couple of things that she's done. With uh, Sasha Payet, yeah, uh, the guitar player of Avantasia, uh, and then uh, and the other singer is Ina Morgan, and then and then another they're the uh, background singers, and Adrian uh, also takes a lead, and then the other guy who's background singer but he takes a lead is Herbie Langens, and he's a phenomenal singer as well. So uh, yeah. between Toby and all of us, there's a lot of vocals going on. Plus. Oliver Hartman takes the lead. So, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a great band, and it took it took me a whole tour to remember all their names. <laughs> Felix Bonka, uh, yeah. you know Miro, the keyboard player and 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 uh, or orchestrator for the for the band. And I love it how we were, I was just doing a text thread with the Avantasia guys mm. about a half an hour ago. And uh, <laughs> we were we were laughing how, uh, like in the middle, in the end of the show, right before a song called "Sign of the Cross," uh, Toby goes. He turns around and we all come out and and, and he, Ronnie Atkins from Pretty Maze. Mm. You know, this is kind of this epic uh, Vikings Game of the Thrones type of. They, they, he's totally going to kill me for saying that shit. <laughs> but like, I, look, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I love the music, and I've been doing it for like six, seven years now. But 
Yeah, I, I, I can't. It's the beginning of the sign of the cross, and it's pretty majestic. But you know, Ronnie has pretty bitch, Jordan Levy, and he goes from America, and the mighty Mr. Big, Eric Martin, and it always gives you such a thrill. Right. <laughs> but we were talking about we were talking about how the first time that I played with him in Japan, and Toby turns around and he goes, Jordan Levy, and he goes. Uh, Bob Cutley, and he looks. He, I didn't come up the stairs right away, so he he forgot who was the next in line. And he goes, <laughs> uh, and he didn't say my name. <laughs> and Jesus. I'm like, oh yeah, hey, introduce me anywhere you want to, you know, all over the world. But like Japan, really? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, wow, we, what we a were bla- laughing about that. What but, a place to forget your name, Jesus. All <laughs> yeah. right. Crazy. Yeah, I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I have, a lot, I have a lot of fun with those guys. We played so many. I played a lot of shows with these guys, and a lot of shows with Mr. Big. But I'm in Tasia. Oh my God! It's like headlining uh, anywhere and everywhere. I mean, you know, you you got those five stages at Sweden Rock, and it's Avantasia headliner, and the next day, and then. Then everybody turns around and watches Kiss or, you know, wow. Iron Maiden. I mean, we played a lot of headline shows. Most of it's headline. Wow. Anyway, it's, it's such a thrill. And then, so I play these, you know, 20 to 90,000 seater concerts. And then I go home and regroup and then go back out and play like 80 to 100 people cafes playing acoustic shows waiting for mr <laughs> big to get their shit together <laughs> that's all right you get two different flavors that's fine that's fine <laughs> yeah but yeah, it, it yeah. is fun i yeah. make it i make it i make it a joke but i it, hey it, it's i i can't imagine a, a different life i mean i'm i can't imagine because i'm living the life right now i feel like i'm in forced retirement mm. which i hate it and but <laughs> I, you know, no offense to the people that sit behind the desk and answer the phones all day. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lucky, lucky man, you know? Oh yeah, I bet. Yeah. Uh, so if I can just go back to Mr. Big for a bit, because you just mentioned the getting shit together part. <laughs> Is everyone in the band at peace with the way you guys uh, finished the last tour and the last album? Um... Everybody's at peace. Mm. It was, you know, it was it was a sad affair yeah. making that album because we made that album with, um, you know, Pat didn't play on it, mm. and he was there to coach Matt yeah. Starr. Yeah, and and it was and it was different. It was, you know, I, I I didn't like the album when I first was was creating it. I didn't I didn't like where it was going because it felt like being rushed, mm-hmm. but. You know, when we went out on the road and started performing that material, I, I liked it a lot more than I did. So, so I did care care about. You know, I, I I didn't want the fans to think I I hated the record. I wanted I wanted them to buy it, but I you know personally I I was I wasn't excited about it in the beginning, mm-hmm. and I was also not excited because I'm sitting on the couch watching Billy, Paul, and Matt play Mr. Big songs. And I'm looking at Pat Torpy sitting on the couch next to me, and I'm going, ah, this is not right, you mm-hmm. know. But it it couldn't be helped. Pat was yeah. sick, you know. And yeah. then we put, and we played a bunch of shows, and then Pat uh, passed away, and totally took the wind out of all of our sails. And yeah, you know, I think that's where we are. And and I just want to let everybody know that you know. We were we we played shows after that. We played with Extreme. We did like an Extreme little mini tour in Australia, mm. and then we played all over Europe. We had um, uh, Chris Jericho's Fozzy opened up to us um, in Europe, um, and we played a lot of festivals. But I think it was mainly. I mean, we we're contractually. We you know we had to do these shows. Mm-hmm. No matter what, but we also it, we did it to to have some sort of not a closure, but some sort of you know you, you don't want you, I didn't want to sit at home 
I was already sad. I didn't want to sit at home with a couple bottles of wine, feeling sorry for myself and, and, and brooding about Pat, you know, I was, Mm -hmm. I was doing that. I just, it was depressing the hell out of me because, you know, Pat was such a force and a great friend and I needed to, I think we all needed to keep working to, 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 you know, to, to get it. It's better to, I'd rather work through it instead of just sitting at home and right. you know, thinking the world is going to end, you know? So anyway, yeah, no. short, we, uh, yeah, we, we, we did that. We, so uh, a couple months ago, I got a, um, a, a email from our record company in Japan saying that we, I didn't even know this either, but they recorded uh, all nine concerts at Torpy's last shows as well in Japan, but mm. all nine concerts in Japan. And I go, I even called Michelle Sobolchek, who is uh, uh, Michelle Sobolchek, who, who's our sound engineer and has been for the last 10 years, live sound. And I go, did you, did you see any Pro Tools equipment around your, <laughs> your front of the house? Did, did they record? She goes, Nobody was recording around me. And I'm like, how, how did you guys do that? We didn't even sign off on it or anything. And, uh, or I don't know. I didn't sign off on it. But it, it, uh, it was recording. And I, I didn't realize this, but they kind of did it every year that we were there. I just never knew it. Mm. And they did it on the monitor board. So they had like a monitor mix of, the, uh, of all nine concerts. But anyway, that being said... They mixed it, and uh, it's nine live shows. Uh, it's a huge title. I don't know what title it is, really. But uh. I think it's called Raw Like Sushi Mega Edition. <laughs> and then it says, Mr. Bit Revive 2017. And what it is is nine shows, a lot of the same songs, different energy in different cities. Mm -hmm. And then there's about three or four shows that have a medley that we never songs We had never fricking play live. Um, uh, You know, switching instruments and the whole kind of thing. If you ever seen a Mr. Big concert, but yes. um, Yeah. Yes. Nine live shows. And it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good. I'm glad that I'm glad that they captured it. I did, and I'm glad I didn't know about it because if I knew about it, I'd get all scared. And yeah. you know, you try to do your best when the camera lights on. I I, I actually hate it. <laughs> That's why I kind of like doing interviews, talking on the telephone, because if the camera was on me with a red light, yeah, I just my 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 ass puckers up. <laughs> it's a different yeah. energy for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's all right. It is. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, let me ask you about uh, something that's – it's a su- subject that uh, might have been beaten to death, but uh, I was watching a video the other day, a new Peart instructional video, like a clinic he did uh, at the time that you guys were opening for them, and you were in the sidelines of that clinic. I don't know if you saw that video. It's like an amateur filming, but you're there. You're watching Neil play. Uh, can you share a few uh, memories of opening for Rush? <laughs> I can't re- – I don't remember because <laughs> – if I'm not talking, I'm probably falling asleep, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Wait, so was it, was it a clinic with the guys in Mr. Big or the guys in Rush or, or all of us? It was only Neil doing the clinic. He's playing like uh, Big Money and uh, Time Sense Steel, those songs. And I think you and Billy, you for sure. And I think Bill is there as well, just watching Neil play. Listen, I, I, you know what I did a lot was, um, so we did two two back-to-back tours with Rush. Mm. Uh, we played um, a Presto tour and then Roll the Bones tour. And we, you know, we shared it with all kinds of bands, you know, got Eric Johnson, Vinnie Moore, uh, what's that band, Les Claypool, Primus. Primus. Yeah. Uh, you know, all, every. They were all over the place. We played a lot of West Coast. We played some East Coast. But we did a, a I, would, I don't know, I would say it's, 
it's up there somewhere. I, I it's it's between sixty to less or more shows, but we we played a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, so our when our tour bus would get there in the morning, and then Rush's tour bus would come way late in the afternoon, and all the crew would be there setting up the gear, and um, our tour bus would be in the sort of the parking lot right behind the semi trucks. And a lot of times I'd wander around the parking lot and talk to the rush head, the rush fans. Right? Okay. <laughs> and the, you know, cause they're all they're It was like an event. They were tailgating. There was a lot of, you know, food and people throwing footballs around. I was like, I don't want to be on the tour bus watching <laughs> Paul Gilbert, listen to uh, Mozart, <laughs> or Billy Sheehan, you know, sleeping in the stateroom, or or Pat Scorpy listening to the Los Angeles Dodgers game. Right. Boring. <laughs> I want to be out hanging out with with the uh, the guy, you know, with the uh, the event people, other than the rest fans. So anyway, there was a lot of times where you know there was a, they they all love Neil Peart. Mm-hmm. I mean, they love Alex and they love Daddy, but they're all air drummers, you know. Yeah. So a lot of times I would bring uh, the fans in with me to see uh, Neil's, to, to see a sound check or uh, go to a clinic and see Neil. I was probably there as a tour guide. Okay. I don't really remember <laughs> too much about that particular clinic. But, sure uh, but, but I'll tell you, I, I spent a lot of good uh, times with Alex and Getty and Neil, uh, make this joke. I used to make this joke where it wasn't a joke. It was real. Mm. I, I was the Getty and Alex. God, I know you, you, you don't have, I, I don't even know how to condense this story, uh. but I'm going to try to do it as fast as I can. Go ahead. Um, we were playing, we were playing in, uh, Colorado, I think. Fiddler's green, something. I don't remember some gig. I was playing the show and we, went into our dressing room and, you know, we had little deli trays and all that kind of stuff. And, and obviously rush were upstairs in the penthouse dressing room with, uh, catered this and, you know, <laughs> champagne minders and yeah. people helping them out. I mean, yeah, they're the, Hey, look, they deserved it. Anyway. Yeah. So we're all kind of crammed up in this little room and we're having a couple drinks and I'm in the doorway and I'm kind of making fun of rush, not in a bad way, but I'm going, mm. yeah, you, these, these guys, they're probably, you know, sipping, oh, no, what, what did I say? They're probably in their three lab coats, <laughs> you know, at the end of the show on the tour bus, their three little lab coats going through the budget of their, you know, <laughs> financial budget and like, you know, you know, just like three beakers, you know, yeah. three like, <laughs> you know, lab rats. I don't remember what else I said, but Billy is looking past me and I'm like going, Oh my God, one of them, they're behind me. Right. (laughs) And I turned around and there's Alex and Getty Uh. (laughs) looking at me right before they're going to go on stage. And they're like, and my nickname was, um, Getty would just say E. Hmm. He would say Eric. He'd say, Hey, like Elvis kind of, you know? Right. And he'd go, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. E. I'm like, oh shit, and it, it was kind of a joke. But the Mr. Big, especially Pat, would go, "Oh God, if you get us kicked off this tour, man, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll murder you." And um, so, so at the the end of the show, uh, Howard Ungerleiter, which is the um, the lighting director, lighting designer, came yeah. up to me, yeah. the lighting designer, of course. He came up to me and he goes, "Hey." Uh, the band want to have a meeting with you on their bus. We got a, we have a, uh, 150 mile run to the next show, about a hundred miles or whatever. And so the band want you to ride with them in the tour bus. They want to talk to you. And I'm like, I'm kind of grinning, but I'm going, oh, God damn it. Is this serious? <laughs> yeah. So I get on, I get on the tour bus. The, my, my Mr. Big Band is waving to me like, yeah, we're never going to see you again. <laughs> and um, so I get on their tour bus and they're not there. 
and I'm waiting and Howard over lighters there. And then, um, uh, um, one of the guys, it was kind of like their main guy. Uh, he helped, uh, put together the keyboard setup and he did a lot of other things too. Uh, this guy, Jack secret, there Tony, was a big, Tony big guy right? in the rush world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he came on, he was talking to Howard for something, but, and he looked at me, he was like, wow. <laughs> really? Like, give me that look like, wow. <laughs> I mean, it was serious face. So he leaves and now I'm getting a little, I'm sweating, you know, I'm going, ah, <laughs> oh, this sucks. Because there's a lot of times in my life where I thought it was funny, but somebody got their feelings hurt. Right. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I know I've been, I, I'm a good guy, but there's a, you know, I do definitely have this troublemaker um, nature. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, nickname. Anyway, yeah. so I so so we're traveling along, and uh, the ba- uh, Neil and Getty and Alex come out, and they're sitting down, and they're <laughs> Alex and Getty are wearing white lab coats. <laughs> okay, and they got this huge book. And it must be there, you know, maybe the financial manager gave them the book or something like that. They're sitting there and they start going through financial touring and, and how much people are being paid and, uh, you know, how much money then they make in the next gig and taxes. And, and they're serious as a heart attack, man. And I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at them and I'm going, oh, this is not cool. And Neil is sitting in the corner just going, shaking his head. Mm-hmm. Reading, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica. Who, who, who knows, you know? <laughs> and um, and they went on for about it went on for about fifteen minutes, and then they started laughing, and uh, they brought out some champagne, and we took, you know, they go, e, it's okay. <laughs> nobody's ever, nobody's ever like done that before, and we we were shocked, but it was kind of funny because you know, everybody thinks that we're unapproachable or everybody thinks that we're, I don't know, remember what he said, but I, but he just made me feel really welcome. And, uh, he was, uh, he was loving that we were on the tour and I think it was the Presto tour. And he, he was like, I would love to have you back. And subsequently, I mean, we, we were asked back. So yeah, whatever I did, I think, whatever I did, I think I secured Two tours for Mr. <laughs> Big with my big mouth. That's all right. That's right. It all worked out in the end. It, it, it worked out, and it was I didn't know this because, I, you know, I, I was in bands, and I played uh, Working Man and In the Mood. and But, you know, anything after that, I listened to Rush, but my musical direction changed, and I wasn't performing Rush songs after right. that first uh, Rush album. Anyway. So I didn't know that much. Paul Gilbert, on the other hand, uh, when we opened our wardrobe cases up for the first show mm. on tour, uh, all these Rush albums came piling out of his wardrobe case. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I, I, want, I want him to sign it. <laughs> yeah, like every Rush album. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, 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 yeah, and Billy was a huge Rush band, Pat. They all played rush at um uh, sound checks or rehearsal i mean they knew everything about rush and so when i was sitting there and we were having our champagne i'm like saying so uh what what's my tour and what's my tour the snow dog <laughs> what, what does that mean and they tell me the whole story about my tour the little white dog that you know that was in the neighborhood or whatever yeah and yeah. then they told me the story about and i go so is Getty, what is Getty? Uh, how did you get that name? And he's like, well, uh, my Hungarian grandmother, she would say, Getty, my name's Gary. And I go, <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't know that. And I didn't know any of that shit. And they're just telling me these stories. <laughs> and a, a real Rush fan, like Billy Pat and Paul, and all those people in the parking lot, the, you know, would kill to be me. But oh, like, absolutely. I didn't know shit. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know shit. And I'm just like, t- I'm talking off the top of my head, you know? Right. But I did say, I did say, you know what I would love? 
well, we, we would love to jam with you sometime. Um, like, you know, come on stage with you. Maybe, you know, it's like a, a tradition where at the end of a tour, bands kind of come on stage together and perform for the, uh, for the audience. And I go, look, I'm just throwing it out there. And it was something that maybe stuck in Getty's mind, but at the last, the last, I want to, I said maybe 10 shows, but I think it was the last four or five shows we went on stage with them and played in the mood. Nice. And, uh, you know, I, I got to sing, you know, I didn't, I didn't say, Hey baby, it's a quarter eight. He did. I I sang like second verse or something or a piece of it. And, uh, and Pat had drumsticks and he was kind of beating on, uh, Neil's uh, little kit. And then, uh, Paul learned the harmony to Alex's solo. And then Billy came out and he played bass a couple times, but, uh, how it's come full circle. You know, I started out in the music business or music business, you know, playing in garage bands hmm. and, um, playing in the mood. And here I am on stage with rush at Alpine Valley in Wisconsin, you know, 20,000 people. And I'm like playing in the mood it was pretty surreal. Yeah. Pretty cool for sure. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, uh, a lot of Rush fans are in our page, and I, I'm going to make sure this is shared on every Rush page on Facebook, man. That's going to bring a smile to their faces, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, look, you know, when I left the bus, oh, oh I, I, let me just say this one last Rush story. Mm. So, like I said, there was about 100 to 150, maybe less miles to the next show and when me and Alex and Getty and Neil and we're all hanging out together they stopped the bus like 50 to 60 miles out in the middle of nowhere and uh, uh. Neil gets out and it, he takes his bicycle off the bus and he rides 60 70 miles maybe even 100 miles to the next show <laughs> and we're watching I mean I it was <laughs> You know, and it was like, you know, I was like, I was like, all right, great. More champagne for me. <laughs> Everybody laughs, you know. <laughs> God, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was fantastic. And I remember look, talking to Neil one time, we used to play baseball games. Mr. Big and Rush would play some, like a softball game uh, with, with a local radio station. We did that a few times. Oh, cool. You know, on, uh, on tour. A lot of band, you know, a lot of bands do that kind of sport, charity sports, uh, uh, basketball, golf, you know, softball. Anyway, we did it, and I yeah. remember talking to Neil for maybe twenty minutes, and he's talking to me, and I couldn't tell you, I felt like such an ignoramus <laughs> talking to him. I, I couldn't add or subtract anything <laughs> I said. I was trying to, I was trying to. Uh, no, no, no! I don't mean that. Wait, wait! What? Stuttering, and he's like, he's so cool, man! What a, <laughs> what a sweetheart of a man! Just the coolest guy ever. I mean, at that gig, and man, I got millions of stories, and you don't have the time. Yeah. But at that gig in yeah. Alpine Valley, when we played in the mood, it was either before it or after it. You know, Neil takes his hat off and shaves his head in front of the crowd. Wow. I mean, it was just, it was just, there was just so much fun stuff happening. Just like, like, hey, can I get one more story in? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> all right, one, all right, one more story in. So, go ahead. we're playing, we're playing in Atlanta, Georgia, mm. and we're playing uh, one of those basketball arenas, and and we used to do this thing in a, one of our songs called "Daddy, Brother, Lover, Little Boy." Yeah, it was the first song on our Lean yeah. Into It album. And the record company, well, well, so somebody asked Paul Gilbert, an interviewer, hey, you're a great guitar player, but, and you're playing really fast. How fast can you play? What a stupid-ass question. <laughs> How fast can you play? Jesus. What, in miles per hour? What a stupid... Anyway, so Paul made this, did this joke, and he glued guitar picks at the end of the bit on his... He had a drill mm -hmm. that he would fix his guitar with, 
I mean, would, you know, the story's been told a million times, but I don't think anybody knows this part of the story. So, yeah. so he played the uh, played a uh, drill solo. They were saying, and even Atlantic Records was like, "We'll call it Daddy, Brother, Lover, Little Boy, the Electric Drill Song." Yeah, yeah okay, that's great. Anyway, so they um, and Billy started doing it too. So at in Atlanta, Georgia, here they come out and they do it, and this and Paul lifts the drill up uh, above his hair head and looks into the audience and he goes, hey, where, where? and he's like, where, 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 with the drill and it gets stuck in his hair and it, and it just like almost takes his whole scalp off, you know? Jesus. And he's like, what should I do? And Billy told him to go behind his amp and Billy would play a, an extended bass solo and, uh, and we would try to get uh, this drill stuck in Paul's hair out. It was a total spinal tap mo- moment. <laughs> and even, and, and Alex and Getty, they're, they're watching the show and they're laughing and we're trying, we're getting butter and grease. And some of them said like, Hey, let's cut it out. No, don't cut my hair. And it was, you know, right. it was like <laughs> a really long, you know, we'll never get those 10 minutes back. Anyway. So, the next day, Alex drew these, I don't even know what they're called, but you know that circle with the line, sideways line through it? And that, that's kind of like, kind of the Germans would say verboten or danger. You're not supposed to go down this area. A <laughs> right. circle with a line through it. Okay, and, a stop and sign. So, yeah, yeah, he drew a yeah. six. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And he drew a, a stick figure of a guy holding a drill and a circle and a line cross it <laughs> and he and they put it all over the backstage area and they even put it on backstage passes it was a big joke <laughs> awesome. on mr big for, yeah. for a long time awesome and the lot and the and the the added part of that story is that we played in atlanta georgia the following year at a nightclub and paul thought hey i'll put a long-haired wig on and then i'll do the same thing and I'll stick the drill in the wig and then he did it a couple of times and, and he went rah, 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 and the wig still uh, spun around <laughs> and so here we are and he does that he sticks the drill in the wig but it got stuck in his wig and his hair Jesus anyway, <laughs> you had to be there man it's hard to tell the story because I'm laughing at the same time but yeah, that's hey, all right. We appreciate it. Anyway. It ain't all that. It, rock, it ain't all that serious in in life, you know. It's yeah. funny. It's yeah, funny. for it's sure. Great. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting to the end here. Uh, how soon do you think we can hear about your future plans, man? In terms of new recordings and new shows, I've seen shows being booked like a second semester of this year for other bands. I mean, yeah. I, oh, I see that a lot. You know, you see, they, you know. I, I saw this one poster of uh, a bunch of bands like Warrant and Quiet Riot and uh, all kinds of stuff. And then it says Eric Martin featuring uh, the members of Trickster. I just saw that poster as for mm. a show in June. But I saw that I saw that same poster last year yeah. where it comes up and it disappears. Uh, they feel they have the feeling that they, they're going to be able to do this uh, in – like I said earlier in the show, COVID comfortably, you know? Yeah. So we'll see. And then the, the Mr. Big with release the, well, yeah. a lot of names. Yeah. Yeah. Revive 2017. We'll be in the middle of February. I would say in April is the live streaming thing for me. Um, by then I'll probably, uh, beat the game cyberpunk. Uh, <laughs> You know, and then maybe, you know, I've been threatening to make a solo album for, so, Rodrigo, you have no idea. Oh, so many man. years. Yeah. And, yes. Do you know which and album I, I'm a I, fan? I forgot to even ask. Hmm? Go ahead. Well, I'm sorry? Uh, I'm a fan of the album. No, uh, I, what, what's the album called in the mid-90s? Uh, Better Days, or? Oh, yeah, it's called uh, Somewhere in the Middle. Somewhere in the Middle, yeah. That's the a album. cool album, yeah. Yeah, somewhere in the middle on that. 
yeah, the song called Better Days. Yeah, it was kind of a, I love that record. It was kind of a Tom Petty esque mm-hmm. uh, type of record. Not not kind of folk rock. Not a not a heavy rock record at all. But a complete departure from all the Mr. Big stuff. Yeah. You know, I I love a lot of like all these albums I put out in that time. I used to get people going. You know, hey, you're a rock singer. What are you putting all this fluff out for? And I, I didn't think it was fluff at all. I thought it was important, and I, I thought it was real soulful, uh, um, a window into my, you know, my heart at the time. Um, lyrically, just a, I thought it was just. I can't even speak in person, but lyrically, I'm a genius. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I thought it was great record. Somewhere in the middle, but all those records were a little. They were so different than this big. And now, I'm changing all that. I'm going to try to get more rock and roll stuff going. So, okay, I look forward to it. Let me just finish off by saying why I tried to book this interview. My daughter's favorite song is "To Be With You" that she listens to like on repeat all day. So I said, I gotta get this guy to talk to me. <laughs> How old is she? She's six years old, and she's like a metal fan or rock fan. Uh, so she loves yeah. Mr. Big Man. <laughs> I, you know, I appreciate that. You know, even so, when my kids were little, they're mm. sixteen years, sixteen year twins, boys. But when they were little, my son Dylan used to bounce on the bed to Highway to Hell, and he had ACDC posters up, and he even had Mr. Big posters up too. But oh, you know, wow. he was like a he loved he loved the the. The beat and the, the energy, especially ACDC, you know, you know with that awesome uh, drum beat, the, yeah. you know, Phil Rudd drum beat. Anyway, um, and uh, so I, I would play To Be With You for him all the time, and he loved that song. Uh, but I also did the theme song for uh, the movie Power Rangers uh, back in the day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me, hey, look, hey, man, it was me, Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses at the time, me and a bunch of other musicians. Uh, Ron Nebison, who produced uh, Physical Graffiti, Led Zeppelin, you know, they, we, we, we were all asked to do this project. And we said, yeah, hell yeah, we're doing it for the kids. <laughs> and so <laughs> we did it. And I remember we have a video of my little son, probably five, six years old, like your daughter. Mm. Uh, daughter, right? Yeah. Stella is her name. Yeah. Yeah. De- ah, beautiful. And <laughs> so we have a video of my son, of my son on his bed with a ukulele and a cowboy <laughs> hat for some reason. And uh, we had a chalkboard in the back that said the Dylan Martin project. And they go, what, what song are you going to sing for us? <laughs> Dylan Martin. And, and he goes, wow, wow. And he's doing his thing. And he goes, are you going to sing daddy's song? And he goes, okay, does daddy want me to sing to be with you? And I go, yeah, that would be great. And he goes, oh, I like the other one. Go, go, power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, so your daughter, your daughter is flying the Eric Martin flag. She My is. son did not do that. Oh, come on! <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm proud of her, man. So uh, I'm I'm trying my best to educate her on rock and metal and all that stuff. So this is part of it. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, hey, we're going to uh, pass the torch down to, to generations. I love that. Absolutely, yeah. So let's finish off with, if you can leave a message for the fans who are eagerly waiting to see you live. I, yeah, you, you think they want to see me live? They've heard oh. me talk for about two hours. I think they're <laughs> done with me. <laughs> uh, come on. Uh, uh, come on, man. Uh, come on, Eric Martin, be serious. Yeah. <laughs> that is not written down. On, that, that you'll never find that Eric Martin, be serious in a graffiti that's on a wall. That'll never be up there. Um uh, yeah, to to the to all my fans around the world. Uh, I've said this before, but I want to say thank you for um, keeping the door open for me and my my band, Mr. Big, um, keeping it in your in your hearts and minds. Uh, God, I mean, there's a lot of shit going on in this crazy world, and the only thing that's going to heal us right now is um, you know brotherhood, sisterhood, and and a little music to uh, soothe our savage beast. <laughs> that was Inside awesome. Inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, Thanks, man. Uh, so 
we have some serious editing to do because we spoke for more than an hour. But uh, thank you so much for the interview. I hope to see you live very soon, man. Hey, you can shop that whole, uh, you know, when I start telling the second story of the... Uh, of Rush. The electric, the electric drill thing, you can, <laughs> like, edit it from there. That's all right. All right. Yeah. But, hey, man, hey, who, who doesn't love a Rush story? Absolutely. There, man. Yeah. I'll send you like I'll send you in an email my picture with Gaddy and Alex that uh, I met him two years ago. I met them two years ago. It was a special occasion. I'm, I I love Rush. Man. So this is going to be a hit for sure. This interview. <laughs> can I can I send you a couple pictures as well? Oh, please do. Of, uh, please do. Uh, yeah, I got a I got a couple pictures of Pat Torpy sitting with uh, Neil. And I think a picture of me and um, Alex and, you know, just like tour pictures. Awesome. Awesome. If I'd I love that. It. Yeah. I'd love that. Thank you so much, man. All right. We'll see you. Oh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed talking to you. I'm sorry I didn't let you talk. No, but, it's okay. Uh, that's the way it is. It's okay. <laughs> I loved it. All right. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Eric. All right, brother. Nice, Take care. Nice meeting you. Nice talking to you. Likewise. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, everyone, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this interview with Eric Martin from Mr. Big. The interview is available in many formats, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. Also, please follow us on Twitter and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let's wrap it up with Stella's favorite song, To Be With You. Stay safe and keep rocking. Hold on, little girl, show me what he's done to you. Stand up, little girl. Broken heart can't be that bad when it's through, it's through. Fate would twist of both of you. So come on, baby, come on over. Let me be the one to show you. I'm the one who wants to be with you. Deep inside, I hope you feel it too. Feel it too. Wait it on. Stop.